All right, guys, welcome to Quantum Learning Sessions. Um, this is a time where our less than technical team, OMs, designers, content writers, um, all the people that make the magic happen, but maybe don't necessarily fully understand what's going on in this crazy quantum computing world we live in, can get together and ask the you know burning questions that we've got and learn some of the, the basic fundamentals. So um, joining us today is Paul Kassebaum. Thank you, Paul. And he's gonna give us a part two lesson on linear algebra. Um, any questions from anybody in the group before we get started? Great. All right, Paul, take it away. Thanks, Jules. Bye, everybody. Uh, so for this talk, uh, I, I watched my first talk, and I, I kind of hated the last part of it because I was doing a lot of hand-waving. So for this talk, I'm par probably going to have a physical demonstration. Um, so that means you're going to want to turn your WebEx session instead of the Brady Bunch to just uh, stage mode if you want to see it better. While I'm, uh, and then I'll, I'll be going back and forth between sharing my screen with like slides and taking those down so I can do the physical demo. Um, and that's why I have a, a light bulb behind me. Um, so, <laughs> um, so it's, let me start with the slides. I'm going to pop those up uh, and then go over here. Cool. All right, presumably you can see this now. <laughs> All right. See a slide? Yep. We can see it. Writing on it. Okay. Yes. All right. Forgive my chicken scratch. But um, some of the things you, you'll hopefully learn from this talk is. Uh, Things like what is a photon? What is a polarizer? What does linear algebra have to do with quantum? A little bit more about that than last time, but a different perspective. And what is quantum superposition really? Uh, and we can only go so far uh, uh, in understanding what it is, but you'll have a, a physical demo so you can poke and prod it later um, instead of just thinking about it abstractly as we did in the last talk. Um, so we'll start with what is a photon? Uh, so photons an indivisible particle of light described by just a handful of properties, right? Uh, what's its position? Its direction of travel, its color. And there are, other, there are a lot of different ways to think about color. Um, but these are like the normal ways to think about a photon. Those first three, you're probably thinking, yeah, sure, that's, that's light, I get it. Um, but there's a fourth one that you may not be as familiar with, uh, another property of each photon called its polarization. Um, actually, you might be a little familiar with it. Uh, um, maybe you have a pair of polarized sunglasses. Uh, so it turns out that those sunglasses are affecting photons in the, that fourth property that you may not think about too often, it's polarization. And just like your sunglasses, I have a couple of uh, sheets of material that are very similar to your sunglasses uh, called uh, a, a absorptive linear polarizer films. And I have a few of these. Um, what are they? So um, just looking at it from, seems to be blocking some portion of light, right? Instead of giving it a color. Um, but, you know, if you zoomed in on this thing uh, with a microscope, or an atomic microscope, you'd see that it's actually uh, nothing more than a bunch of chains of polymers that are kind of all stretched out in one direction. So there's a sort of directionality to these, these films. And I'm going to turn on my light here. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second and show the part of my first physical demo here. And actually, I need to change my screen settings too so I can see what I'm doing. No, we're good. Um, so I can't see myself, which is unfortunate. Um, what's going on with WebEx? 
Sorry, guys. Good enough. Uh, one second. Okay, so I'm going to turn the light on here, and I'm going to put this one one of these films in front of it. You'll see it's blocking a bunch of some of the light, right? And I can turn it around like this, and it just nothing's changing, right? Uh, just just like your sunglasses. This is really just like what your sunglasses do. But I have another sheet of this material. I, I, I cut a bunch of, I cut one big piece up into multiple, multiple pieces. Here. And I said that these have a certain directionality to the polymers. So if I put them both in the same, with the two films with their polymers in parallel with each other, it's like I had one. So it's not actually filtering more. Right. Uh, but if I start rotating one, with respect to the other. Spooky. <laughs> yeah, that's so that's cool. cool. Yeah, super right. cool. And you don't usually, even if you have polarized sunglasses, you don't usually, you wouldn't stumble upon this effect unless you ripped the two lenses out or you had two pairs. <laughs> Can you do it again, so, please, Paul? Yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> so here's one. So is each eye of the sunglasses a different direction? Oh, good question. Um, they're they're actually they're both both lenses are oriented have the film oriented the same way. But um, you might also ask which way. <laughs> if they're are they both have the chains up and down like these are right now, or are they both left and right? And you see with a single film, there's no difference. Right? Or is that if, if you've ever. If you've ever accidentally taken home 3D glasses from the theater, <laughs> yeah, they're, they work on polarized. 3D right. glasses, yes, that's right, Herman. 3D glasses have them. The two lenses are different. Sunglasses aren't, but there actually is an important choice, even in the normal sunglasses, in which direction the film goes, and we'll get into that later. So, although it seems like it doesn't matter right now. I do this, nothing's happening. So why would it matter in sunglasses? We'll get into that later. So here's the second sheet. The first, nothing strange happened. Uh, it, it's, you might think it's kind of weird. I think it's kind of counterintuitive that one or two, it's the same. It's kind of weird. But even weirder still is as you start rotating them relative to each other, there'll come a point I can get the pair like flat you'll be like totally blocked. Um, you could probably just do that the whole hour and we would just watch. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Magic. Yes. That's not okay. science. So, so those films are, are doing, are, are um, affecting the photons based on their polarization, that fourth property. Um, and based on a little experiment, um, you'll see that whatever the heck polarization is, of a photon, it seems to have some sort of directionality to it. Let me start sharing my, my slides again. Okay. So they're being filtered in a way that depends on the orientation of those two filters with respect to each other. So if I, once I had them blocking the light, if I started rotating the pair of them, I'll do it right real quick. If you can still see me. Once I've blocked most of the light and I rotate the pair of them together, the light, I can keep them flat. Okay. If I rotate the pair, nothing actually should be happening. If it is, it's because I'm messing up the, the sheet being flat with my camera. <laughs> Effectively, nothing happens. So it's their relative orientation, not some special orientation in space. Um, so photon polarization, whatever it is, must have an orientation to it also, just stands to reason. So when you, physics is in physics, unless you're really using mathematics. And so if you 
wanted to try to talk about this thing quantitatively, this polarization quantitatively, and you, you just observe that it has some sort of something to do with orientation, and you have substantial math education, which not everyone does, but it, you, you engineers and math and science majors in their first or second year will learn this a sort of math, or even in geometry class in high school, or maybe middle school if you're lucky, you'll come across geometry and coordinates and talking about directions on, on, a, on a coordinate plane. And vectors are a common mathematical idea to represent orientable things, uh, such as location. So here's a drawing of a north vector and an east vector and some location that you might say is go to get there from here, where here in the, where the axes intersect to get there go say one mile north and two miles east. And those two numbers and directions will let you know where I'm telling you to go. Other things that are, are describable by vectors uh, because they're they have an orientation to them include wind. You might say the wind today is blowing due northeast at 20 miles an hour. And I would say that the, um, the, the wind strength in the north direction is equal to the wind strength in the east direction. And if you combine those two together, you're going to get 20 miles per hour in the northeast direction. So maybe photon polarization can be described as a vector also. So what can we think about with vectors? Here uh, I have two perpendicular axes, one going vertical, one going horizontal. Um, and I think of these axes as being built up of as arrows or vectors that have a certain direction and have a length one. I'm going to use that these length one vectors as my yardsticks for every other vector. Um, so here's a general, a general vector that uh, physicists like to use quantum vectors, common label for them is the Greek letter psi. So the, the vector psi can be a little bit, say alpha, some amount alpha along the horizontal vector. This is my horizontal yardstick. And a little bit beta along the vertical vector yardstick. And another way to think about this is to say, if I were to cast a, a shadow, sorry, I'm gonna go back a slide. If I were to cast a shadow um, from all the way over here on the right to over to the vector, hit the vector, and it would cast a shadow, the vector would cast some shadow from this origin out to beta. This, this thing would be like the vector shadow if I cast light from the right. If I cast light from above downward onto the vector, it would cast the vector's shadow would look like this length alpha. And thinking about casting shadows like that, uh, mathematicians use the word projecting the vector. And so I can project the vector psi down to the horizontal axis, I would get its length along that axis, alpha. If I project the vector psi onto the vertical axis, I would get how much of it lies along the vertical axis, beta. So that word project comes from that, in, that analogy of light and shadows and projectors. The way that you, a physicist would write those projection statements they would take that arbitrary vector psi and they'd say, here's my vector psi. I'm going to project it onto the horizontal. And these, this, this symbol here is meant to evoke the idea of projecting and like pushing two vectors, one vector onto the other, but through this light. So you, you kind of imagine you're smashing the two vectors together, just as you'd be pushing light, pushing the vector down onto one of these axes. So 
This is saying projecting the vector psi onto the horizontal axis equals how much of it is on that axis, alpha. Hey, Paul, quick yeah. question. You're saying that this notation, the, the the bracket notation, is supposed to like symbolize this idea of projecting or pushing it to like a lower space. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, if you if you take if you think of a vector, you say everything I'm going to consider a vector. I'm going to write it like this: a vertical line, an angle, kind of thing, and some symbol in the middle to distinguish them. Like I can distinguish the horizontal from the vertical. You think of projecting as like casting light. And then if you want to project one vector onto another, from that G from that visual representation, thinking of vectors kind of getting smashed onto another one through light projection. In algebra, you you this sort of smashing together idea is captured through this sort of symbol. I've totally never heard that before. I really like that. Thank you. Yeah, that's how I think about it. And um, so what's interesting here is this, these projections. You're taking a thing, you're taking two things, two vectors that have a directionality and, um, and length, right? And you're taking the two of them and you're using them to output this other quantity, a number. The number has no directionality to it. Um, and you can project one vector onto any other vector this way, and the result will be a number, not, it has no direction, just an amount. So, um, one way, so one other kind of, at first, strange concept is to ask, what is it, what would it mean to project a vector onto itself written like this, say the horizontal vector, this guy, that looks like this arrow here. Geometrically, it's an arrow in this direction. Symbolically, algebraically, it's this thing. This symbol. So what would it mean to project this vector onto itself? Well, I said earlier it has a length one, it's gonna because it's gonna be our, our yardstick for everything in that direction. But what does the geometric interpretation of like how do you project something onto itself? Well, imagine not the vector psi and itself being projected onto itself. But think of a vector that's, you have psi and a copy of psi that's only a little bit different by rotating it a little tiny bit in some direction, a little tiny angle of rotation. And if you project this slightly different vector onto the original vector, and you ask how much is it lying along, how, what's the length of that shadow? It's gonna be about as long as the original vector. Right. As that vector, and so as that angle gets smaller and smaller and smaller, that shadow is going to be more and more exactly the length of the original vector, right? So mathematicians say in the limiting case, when that angle goes all the way down to zero, then that's where we get the concept of the length of a vector is its own projection onto itself. And so I, these yardsticks I told are designed to have a, a length of one. So you take one of the yardsticks, you project it onto itself, it should be a one. You take another, you take a pair of these perpendicular yardsticks and you project one onto the other, the shadow would be zero. Right. Okay. So now wait. Yeah. Sorry, real quick. You so right. you're saying if we were to take A and project it onto B. It's zero because it's just pointing right at the origin, basically. Yeah, that's right. So, it, so let's look at the vertical um, vector and the horizontal vector. Both of them have a length one, and they're they're uh, perpendicular to each other, ninety degrees, orthogonal, different words, same thing. If we were to take the vertical vector here and shine a bunch of light from above down onto the horizontal vector, the shadow. Here's the arrowhead, the shadow would just be zero. It would have no length along this direction. Right. Yep, got it. Yeah. So um, if we take the horizontal vector and project it onto itself, it's one through this thinking about this angle getting smaller and smaller. And if we take the horizontal and project it onto the vertical, the answer, the, the projection is zero. 
Okay. Now, those are the basic things. That, so all that was linear algebra, by the way. So this is all a, a part of linear algebra, another part from the last lecture. Last time we talked about symmetry operations on an equilateral triangle and matrices that represent those things. These are, these are, this is talking about vectors, which is another mathematical idea in the branch of math called linear algebra. Paul, quick, and, quick question. Yeah. Um, that very small angle, are, are you going to be talking about that angle approaching zero? Is that what you're saying? That very small angle? Yeah, to understand a, a projecting a vector onto itself, what does that mean? Okay, got it. Yeah. So if this angle is small, but not zero, but really close to zero degrees, and you have a, some vector and a copy of that vector that's just been rotated a little tiny bit, and you project down onto this horizontal vector, the shadow is going to be really close to the original vector's length. And as that angle gets smaller and smaller, the shadow is going to get longer and longer until it reaches the full original length. And so mathematicians say, if we were to imagine going all the way to zero angle, then that length, that shadow would have the length of the original vector. <clears throat> okay, so that's just the first kind of the first principles behind that concept. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, got it. Cool. And now, um, so those are like the main things that vectors let us think about. Directionality, um, breaking a vector up into perpendicular parts, projecting vectors to get those parts out. Um, what it means that we can even project a vector onto itself. And I'll show you why that matters next in the next little bit. Okay, so now those are the basics of the mathematical tool of a vector. And we, again, from our experiments, we're pretty sure a polar, polarization of photons has a directionality to it. So, may, so we're going to explore whether or not vectors can be used to understand this thing. Polarization. <laughs> um, so I'm going to propose that polarization of a photon can be written as a, as a vector. And I'm going to think about that photon before it hits either of the films. So it's coming from the light bulb back here towards the camera, right? So as it's coming from the light bulb, before it hits one of the films, that's what this part of the, the arrow of this diagram means. When it meets the first film oriented horizontally, this is the circle with the two arrows here. This represents hitting this film some number of photons gets through. Let's say that number is N, because I don't know how many, I don't, I don't care how many is coming out of the light bulb, but whatever comes through, we'll say is N photons. Then it travels until it meets a second filter, which is oriented vertically. And what we've observed is that this pair, this pair of filters, the end result is effectively zero photons are getting through that number zero. So uh, let's see where our math takes us. So here's the polarization while it's coming from the light bulb. And it's going to hit this uh, filter. By the way, I'm sorry. So the, the, the fact that the, fil the filter is when I'm changing their directionality seems to be killing the light speaks to me to say that maybe what we're doing is we're filtering out photons based on their polarization direction, filtering out. And so maybe the idea, maybe these filters are doing something like forcing the polarization vector to lie along the direction of the molecules that make up this thing. In other words, projecting the polarization vector onto a direction of the molecules in the film. That's why we're exploring this, sorry. So let's let's explore that here mathematically. Here's the polarization vector from the light bulb. It hits this filter. Maybe this filter is doing something like projection. So let's project this down here. I don't know what the polarization vector is yet or what it even means. So I'm going to write it in the most general way I can for now. So this, I have an equal signs on the right here. I'm going to carry this down. I'm not going to, that's the same thing. I'm going to rewrite this psi in the very general form. 
some amount alpha horizontally plus some amount beta vertically. Sort of like, an al again, it's analogous to saying, oh, to get to Trader Joe's, go one mile north and two miles east. <laughs> So the alpha and beta are how much? And how much of what? I don't know yet. We'll talk about that. <laughs> so um, the, then we have another equal sign. Okay, so the rules of linear algebra with the vectors here have a lot in common with the rules of multiplying numbers, regular old numbers. So I've written the, the full expression of psi with curly brackets around it like regular multiplication, I'm going to be able to take this vector and distribute it to both parts of this sum. So I'm expanding that product out just like you would with normal numbers. And then these pieces here are, are, are vectors, but these alphas and betas are just numbers. And so uh, similar to the multiplication rule of that, say, 2 times 4 is 4 times 2, I'm going to take the liberty to reorder some of these things. I'm going to move the alpha out front of this product, and I'm going to move the beta out front of this product. Okay. And then now here's where those, those projections of our yardsticks come into play. Quick question. Paul. Also, sorry? A quick question. Are, yeah. are you preserving? Are you... Uh, do these represent just magnitudes, or like, are these are these? <laughs> Great question. Possible? Great question. What does the alpha and beta mean physically? We don't know yet in this lecture. We're just playing okay. around with math for now. The whole this whole lecture, we're playing around with math ideas, and and at different points, we're going to ask, but what does that mean in, in real in the real world? For now, we don't know. I, I, I was asking beta. because. Yeah. I was asking because I know in vector math, sometimes we use dot and cross product, but you're not, you haven't, you're not using that here. So I, it's, I'm a little confused. <laughs> yeah. So for now we're saying, for now, what we're saying is that let's presume that the alpha and beta are just some sort of numbers, just some sort of numbers. We don't know about their units. Like, is it miles? Is it seconds, miles per second? We don't know yet, but just that there's some sort of number. Does that make sense, Herman? Yeah, I, I won't hold it up. I'll, I have to digest okay. it a bit. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But your question is a good one, and we'll, we're going to be exploring that. So. If you if you grant me the liberty to do these sorts of manipulations, algebraic manipulations, we've we've come up to this line here so far, and now we have a projection of the horizontal vector onto itself, and the horizontal vector onto the vertical vector, which are orthogonal to each other. And if we think again, like Russell asked, if we cast light from above the shadow of this vector, there will be no shadow along this direction and vice versa. If I sh shown light from the side, then the, this vector, the horizontal vector would have no shadow along the vertical vector. Paul? So, yeah. Um, so when you read these, is this the projection of the thing on the right onto the thing on the left? Or vice versa. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good question. And so these guys, because they're, uh, because they're perpendicular to each other, the projection is zero. And these guys, it's a self projection. And we said that we designed, we designed this system so that these guys have a length of one, so we can use them as yardsticks. And so this projection is one. Alpha times one is just alpha. Okay. Um, so the, so now we, we've, I've demonstrated to you, I've show, demonstrated how linear algebra works when you're kind of turning the crank and trying to calculate these sorts of projections. And like I said earlier, a, a projection should output just a number. So alpha is just some number. Now let's start talking about how this math is dealing with representing the physics so far. So if the photon polarization is a vector before it hits the first filter, 
it, it should stay a vector after the first filter. This is just some physics reasoning. Um, so far, we had a thing that was a vector. We thought maybe the filter is doing something akin to a projection. And, but the thing that came out the other side is a number, right? That's not good for physics theory. If polarization's a pol if the polarization was a vector here, it should stay a vector. So we're not quite there. In other words, if we were to think of this horizontal filter as like multiplying onto the vector of the polarization, h onto psi, the output should be what the alpha that was lying along the horizontal originally, this piece here. Should if it, the projection, if the filter is a projection, it should be we're leaving this piece here because it's the piece that's along the horizontal direction. And it's just, and what's nice here is that the other side is also vector like instead of number like. This idea here of just doing a projection, we got the alpha part, that's good, but we're missing the vector like element of it. So this horizontal, Sorry, yeah. Oh, H, H is for horizontal? Is that, yes. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, yes. Good question. Yeah. We're, I'm starting to try to write the, the, the filter operation in the language of linear algebra. So look, we'll use a symbol called H. And from the first lecture, think about the things we were doing to the triangle symmetry operations and we started we started right off the bat with symbols for those things we were doing something to the triangle with symbols and we derived things that looked like multiplication uh, between those symbols so we're doing something similar trying to do something similar here imagine the filter the horizontal h for horizontal filter is doing something to the polarization that on paper looks reminds you of multiplication just how it's written and so that it has an effect on psi. And it should, if it's a projection onto the horizontal, should spit out this vector because of the original form of psi had that in there in the horizontal direction. So we captured the alpha part, but we're missing the directionality part. So let's put those two together. And so the horizontal operation should look like this. Now this looks pretty weird, I'm sure. And all this stuff must look weird, but this should look even weirder still. What is this? Here we have this piece, which we got from here, because that's like the projection-like aspect of the filter. This piece that we over here is what allows the the outs the other side of the of the filter to have the polarization stay a vector. It's really this piece here, and here is the demonstration. So if H is, is actually written like this, then H on Psi, H, if it looks like this, I'm going to rewrite H like this, and I'm going to bring the Psi down just as it was. And this thing we calculated, the projection of Psi onto the horizontal is just the number alpha. And I'm just going to bring this down with, with us for free. And I'm gonna say two times four is four times two, and that's kind of what's happening here. So I'm gonna move, switch, switch them around. And so indeed, if, if we think of the filter algebraically as this thing that says that it's like a projection onto the horizontal direction of the polarization vector with this other thing that, to, make, to guarantee that the output is still vector-like, we get, what we would expect, right? It's, so now we're saying, oh, okay. So this thingy is like, it's doing a projection onto the polarization of the photon, which is itself vector-like. Okay. So, now, um, yes. Are, are you saying essentially the vector, any photon either is a vector itself or is made up of a number of smaller vectors and 
<laughs> Great question. <laughs> You're bringing the good questions. Out. <laughs> like the, so, the, the filter is the polarized lens is blocking out a part of that vector or or a number of those vectors. I don't know. Those are the right <laughs> those are the right questions, Herman. Hold on to that. Hold on to that question. That's the exact right question. I'm only going to answer the first part of your question though, which was is the is the photon a vector? All we're looking at so far is one of the aspects of a photon, which is just the polarization. We're not talking, we're not exploring the color, the position, or the directionality, all these other things that go into describing a photon. So, so far, all we've postulated here is that the polarization of a photon is a vector. We're not, we haven't said anything about those other qualities. Your other questions, hold on to them. <laughs> Good questions. <laughs> all right, so now, excuse all the background noise, sorry. Um, so now, let's look at whether or not this idea of projection, we just kind of thought it through for a single filter. Let's see if this idea of projection explains what we were seeing with the two filters, which at first, I think, it rightfully amazed everybody, right? So we thought through what the horizontal filter is doing. And there's nothing special about this. The vert, so the vert, or if it works for the horizontal, it should work for the vertical orientation of the filter just as well. We're just going to use the other vectors. I miswrote this one, but instead of the two vector like things here being horizontal, the, the vertical filter should be written like this with the two vector like things being the vertical filter. Now, let's think through, this is the, the similar diagram, but for the case of both filters, where, they're, where their molecule orientations are perpendicular to each other. So originally it's coming from the light bulb, it hits the horizontal filter, some number of photons N comes through that, then it hits the vertical filter and effectively zero, filter, zero photons come through that. So let's think of this as stage one, stage two, and stage three of the polarization. Stage one, we're going to say we, we know nothing about the polarization, so we're going to write it in a very general way. Stage two, we just explored. H acting on the polarization vector. Here's my cheat sheet. H is this thing. So replace H with that thing. Carry the psi down. We calculated earlier that this thing, psi, projected onto the horizontal piece should just spit out the, uh, the, the shadow that lie, of psi that lies along that direction, alpha. And then this thing comes along for the ride. All right. Cool. That's, so now, now we've, gone, we've figured out stage two so far. Now let's do stage three. Stage three says we had the polarization vector. It hit the horizontal filter, and then it hit the vertical filter. That'll take us to stage three, right? H on the psi, we calculated just above. So I'm gonna rewrite it as alpha horizontal. And I'm gonna bring the V along for the ride. Now for my cheat sheet, V is this thing. I'm gonna move the alpha out front. Again, that's the two times four, or four times two. They're equal to each other. So I'm gonna move the alpha out front. That's where the alpha comes over here out front. The V I rewrite with my cheat sheet as the two vertical vectors like this, and the horizontal vector I just bring down for the ride. And then we see this, we have a projection between the two orthogonal vectors. This should be zero. And there are different ways to think about what a zero vector is. One way is to say it's a vector with a direction and, and zero length. <laughs> it's still are, a vector. Are you missing are you missing a line in there? Uh, uh, uh vertical line between the two last symbols. These guys? Yeah. Oh, Should there question. be a double yeah, so, line in there? Yeah, it's, uh, what we, what physicists usually do is instead of drawing the vertical line for both vectors, they'll just draw a single line when you're doing the projection between the two. Because um, you, you, like, you switched around the order, right? You said there's a, I forget what they call, what you call that property, but a math, but um, yeah. 
So when you had it written the other... Yeah, if we go up here in the cheat sheet here, and if we look at H here, indeed, we have this thing that we've been using for vectors, and then we have this thing where the 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 two the two um where it kind of looks like we we flip the symbol mirrored the symbol horizontally yeah and that's on purpose and again that was from thinking through how can we write how can we think of the can we think of the filters as being a projection and the fact that we, if it was a, if polarization was a vector before it needs to stay a, a vector after the filter and so we we found that we needed this other piece pointing in the other direction. Right, but when you so, substituted for V. Yeah, V. When you substitute for V, you have three vertical lines, right? If Maybe I'm getting too much into the detail, but when you substitute for V, you get, you have three vertical lines. Right, you could. If you don't, One, two, right? And, three. Right, and then when you move them around, you ended up with only two vertical lines. Well, all I uh, so what I moved really was just the alpha. I said, let's the move alpha. the alpha out front. I'm going to swap the V and the alpha's order. Alpha out front. Then V came over here. Yep. And I just, and I kept this, the order of these guys the same. Yeah, but you're missing the last line. No. I, okay, I, I won't hold it up, but I just... Um... I'm just wondering if it's notation that if you have two lines beside each other, you just write one. Yes, that's correct. That's, that's just, okay. yes, that's like an artistic style of physicist. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got it. Convention. Yes. Now, um, so it's a zero, this thing is a zero vector. So it's still vector like, but it, it's gone. <laughs> Effectively, it's gone. And so this is, this looks good, right? Because um, it's killing the polarization, and it and it and it only and it it has to do with the directionality of the filters, and it has to do with the fact that the two filters are made up of these vectors that are perpendicular to each other, and that they're they're so the idea of these filters is as projecting the polarization vector along a direction. That's de determined by the directionality of the molecule chains in the film. Seem to be doing the physics for us correctly. Hey, Paul, can I ask real quick? Um, I'm trying to connect the dots on how we got from the second to last line to the last line. Is it because the going from right to left, the horizontal and the vertical equals zero, right? Because it's projecting one into the other. And is that zero basically alpha times zero is zero? So it's just zero? Yes, that's right. Alpha in the vertical direction times zero is zero like, okay yes exactly this is a number alpha is a number and this is a vector so the two numbers get multiplied together to get a new number zero so Perfect. why does the vector portion remain that has to do again with um the thing that came out the other end um is still a photon uh like it's very similar to sorry it's very similar to the idea of this limiting process to understand self projection um so what you would say is if the if the uh the angle between these guys is really small almost 90 degrees uh, the difference from 90 degrees is really small right oh the, the okay. close to zero and if we go all the way to 90 degrees, boom, we hit zero, right? So it's like just being consistent with what is happening when you're just a little bit off from 90 degrees versus all the way 90 degrees. But you're saying, okay, I get it. So it could be like 0. 0.00001, whatever. Yeah. As small as you, as you want to make it, yeah. it still has a vector component to it. Yeah. My and question we, is, it seems arbitrary that you it, that it became a vertical vector, and if you would have done the math differently, it would be a horizontal vector. No. If we did the math differently, I have to think about that. If we'll you talk. switch the order of the filters, wouldn't you get and did the math the other way around? Wouldn't you not get the a horizontal math, I would vector? Say not, it's not. We do the physics the other way around. It, yeah, and, if you did the yes. physics. 
the other yeah. way around. And so <laughs> this, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Herman, I'm gonna I'm gonna table this. It's a good question. It's not a silly question. What is a zero vector? Is a, is actually a, a, a good question, and it's it's weird. It's counterintuitive. We'll talk. We can talk about it later. <laughs> all right. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> oh, no, not your bad at all. <laughs> good question. All right. Now let's do another physical demonstration. After I have you think about this. Now that you understand what's going on in this case, first thing I showed you, having the two filters being 90 degrees from each other, perpendicular from each other, is killing all the light. What if I added a filter? So two filters in these special relative orientation gives me no light. Um, what do you think about, what would happen if I add another filter in the middle? So I'm already getting nothing. What if I had another filter? So if if we're just playing around with numbers, um, we're saying after it comes through the first filter, some n got through. In this case, in the first case, n got through, then it hits another another filter, and zero get through that. Okay, these are the same direction. So n gets through in this other case. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm asking you guys to think about this. But in general, some proportion of the original n would would get through. It could be zero, but we'll represent that proportion by a, a number d. So d is some fraction. One says it all gets through. A half means a half of n got through, and so on. And then it hits the vertical filter, just like in this case. And then the vertical filter again might be zero, but in general, some fraction of what came before it gets through, and we'll say that fraction is a V. Again, that V could be from zero to one, or half, a quarter, so on. And then so in the end, the N becomes some fraction V times D times N. So V and D are half both, then in the end it would be V times D is a half times a half is a, a quarter of N. Right? This is very generally written out. I'm not saying this is how it works. But one way to quantitatively think about what's happening is these V's and D's, yeah? So think, I really want you to think about this. Case one, I showed it to you, effectively zero. Now I throw another filter right in the middle. What's gonna happen? Now think about that and also think about this. Third scenario, again, horizontal filter, some N photons get through. But now I'm going to switch from case two, I'm going to switch the order of the two filters in case two so that it's now it hits not diagonal, but vertical and then diagonal. <laughs> What's going to happen here? Just think about it for a minute. Okay. Okay, now we're going to do a demo and run the experiment. Well, both of these experiments. Okay. Um, let me um, stop sharing. Okay, I'm gonna turn my light on. Okay, one filter, second filter. We did this demo before. Effectively zero. I think that's a pretty zero. Sorry, yeah, be pretty zero. I got a, a third filter here. And I'm going to make it a diagonal filter. I'm going to do case two first. Whereas where I slip this, I'm going to slip this diagonal filter in the middle between these two filters. It's crazy. What? <laughs> no, that is not okay. <laughs> I'm going to take this diagonal filter. I'm going to put it, I'm going to, Put it at the to be the last filter instead of the middle. Okay, mind blown. Yeah, crazy. For the middle, for the first one that you did like that, um, I, I couldn't tell if it was fewer photons or if it was just like it went back to the to all photons going through. Don't have to take anyone's word for it. So let's. <laughs> Let's do it. No, don't do it again. You're a monster. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Abby, was that okay. you? Yeah, it was that was me as usual. What's what's um, the what's your observation? I uh, well, it, if you could take away two of them now, so I could see what it looked like in the original. Well, I'm, I'm positioning it so it's the the, the third filter is only yeah half the bulb. On but, but it feels like it's back to back to just one filter. But oh, I don't I know what you're asking. Yeah, yeah, I can't I can't tell if that's just you know most photons or all photons. <laughs> Um, but it's pretty, it's pretty market. Right. It's pretty no, 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 that's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, how would I demonstrate that? Um, I guess, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. What? No, actually, I'm not. I'll get back to you on that. Sorry. No, <laughs> You're on camera. You're going to have to You're going to need the math to show it. <laughs> yeah, I can figure it out with the math. I'll talk to you later, Abby. Good question. <laughs> But the answer, I can't, I'm going to have a hard time figuring out how to demonstrate it, but the answer is that it's, it's less, it's less than the one filter. Good. Okay, great. Cause that's what it kind of looked like. So that, that makes good. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, okay. The problem is, wait, how do you get more? There are a lot of problems. So let's, <laughs> so let's go through the first filter, but then you add a second filter and it brings back some of the ones that yeah, that's right. <laughs> As you all saw with your own eyes, no CGI. We took the <laughs> scenario where there's nothing coming out and we added more filter, an additional that's filter in the middle, and some and more photons got out with more filters than got out with just two. And then we switched the order of the filters. Right. And we saw that it's just like the first case. Nothing got through. And here's why that one shouldn't be too surprising on its own, on its own. So third case, case three on its own shouldn't be too weird because case three is case one first plus a new filter. Case one, this V we've shown is zero, right? So whatever, whatever this thing does with D, it's D times zero. So it should be zero. Okay. So case three on its own is not weird, but case three in conjunction with case two, and case two is weird on its own, but in conjunction with each other, they're actually weird. Because if you remember from my first lecture, linear algebra allows order of operations to matter in a way that normal number multiplication doesn't, right? Normal numbers two times four equals four times two. I showed you in the first lecture that symmetry operations of an equilateral triangle uh, do this, then that is not always the same as do that and this, or A times do A, then B is not the same as do B, B, then A. And we're seeing that right here in these two scenarios, right? First, first in both cases, do this. Then in this case, do that, do A, then B. In the other case, do B, then A. We're getting very different answers, or di very different physical results. <clears throat> Okay, so here was sort of, this is the thesis, kind of the kernel of the first lecture, okay? but with, with the physical demo <laughs> this time. And, and so why linear algebra? This is why. Also why you saw earlier, the vector stuff, right? So vector stuff is linear algebra, but the do this, then that, do A, then B versus B, then A. Also, that's why linear algebra. Okay, now let's make sense of what in the world is going on between scenario one and two. What the heck? You know, scenario one actually surprised pretty much all of you. It, and, and it did to, to me too. Okay, so scenario one is already weird. <laughs> but scenario two, that's weird. <laughs> let's make sense of it if we can with what, with what we've built up so far. So... <clears throat> Let's just think of the a, a filter that's oriented, not vertical or horizontal, but right in the middle, 45 degrees orientation, written like this. So again, this is the, the, the diagram here is saying the photons are coming from the light bulb and they hit the diagonal filter and they come out the other side. And originally we wrote the polarization vector in, in a general way, psi, with some alpha and beta, horizontal and vertical. We don't know what those are yet. But on the, it comes out the other side, we're, we're pretty confident we're on the right path. So let's hold on to the idea that polarization is vector-like and that these filters are like projections. So on the other side, it's 
whatever psi was, it got projected to a new polarization vector, which we'll write like this this time. What should this thing be uh, written as algebraically? How much of it should be along the horizontal and how much of it should be along the vertical? Well, if this or if the film is, is really 45 degrees um, and it's really vector-like, then whatever amount of it is lying along the horizontal, alpha, should that amount alpha should also be lying along the vertical if it's vector-like, right? Just through drawing like this and saying it's really 45 degrees. So <clears throat> instead of writing it as alpha horizontal plus beta vertical, I'm going to pull, I'm going to say there it's alpha along both directions, and I'm going to pull the alpha out. And, and this sort of like alpha times this plus this. And why can we say it's alpha on both as opposed to alpha and beta? Um, and I am I'm so sorry to actually cut you off there, Russell. We've actually got to use this channel for a user test right now. Um, so maybe if Paul, you could answer Russell, uh, maybe online or in Slack, or you know, Paul, feel free to. Um, I don't know. Add, add a note in your uh, recording, or I don't know. Uh, send me the answer, and I'll make sure to post it in notes. Sure. So we're out of time. <laughs> so. But this is um, great. This is really. Team, I can open up my WebEx right now, and we can jump over there because I'm feeling a, I'm feeling the cliffhanger. You know. Seriously. <laughs> okay. Okay. Tom Whoever can join, jump on mine. <laughs> okay, I'll post it uh, in a second. It, Thank you. Share it in the chat here. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, Jules. It's, it's okay. coming. There. Click it. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Over there. Yeah. Bye. Bye. So okay. Russ, why? Why? Why, why should these alphas be uh, along both directions? And Abby, you're getting at it, which this is just a symmetry argument. It's just that if this is really a 45 degree angle, um, then if you imagine putting a mirror here, um, <clears throat> or if you think of like um, the symmetry between your hands, right? You should be able to fl flip around that flip around this vector and it and it should be it should look the same so whatever if it's alpha along here if this is really down the middle angle the middle angle then i should be able to reflect along it and see alpha here as well special case for the 45 degree angle make sense russell yep perfect okay thank you so we're writing, so we'll write this uh, diagonal vector <clears throat> as some amount alpha along both directions like this. So it's sort of like alpha times this plus alpha times that. And I'm just pulling the alpha out, the common factor alpha. All right, so <clears throat> let's now uh, see what happens when we put the diagonal vector through a uh, We've we've sent the photons through the diagonal filter. Now let's put it through another filter after that. Let's say let's say the horizontal filter. <clears throat> All right, so I've added a few symbols to this diagram up at the top. Focus on the diagram first. It, the polarization is some arbitrary some unknown mix of alpha and beta. Goes through the diagonal filter. It it gets this. Uh, it turns into this vector, which is some alpha. We don't know what alpha is yet. Back to Herman's earlier questions. What is alpha and beta? We don't know. Whatever it is, it's just as much alpha along this as it is alpha along that. <clears throat> and we're going to say, again, some n number of photons gets through this first filter. Second filter, we'll say, is horizontal oriented. Um, from our the theory, theory we've built up so far, we're saying, what the thing that happens to this polarization vector is that the horizontal filter is acting on it. And we're saying that <clears throat> the number of photons gets reduced by some factor of little h. Little h could be some number between zero and one. One means they all got through, half h equaling a half means a half of the n got through, and so on. <clears throat> so big H represents the operation of sending it sending the diagonal polarization vector through the horizontal h for horizontal filter and little h is some fraction uh, to represent how much how many photons got through <clears throat> okay that's what this how to read this diagram 
again, all right, so this uh, polarization vector, diagonal vector, is some alpha times this. We're sending it through the horizontal filter, it's so capital H onto it. From our cheat sheet earlier, capital H should be this combination of these two horizontal vectors oriented, the symbol oriented differently, right? <clears throat> And then we re and we're expanding and we're just rewriting the diagonal vector in terms of this alpha so and so. That's this piece here. And then we're going to do things very similar to multiplying numbers again, right? First, alpha is a number. Everything else in this row, line in this line, everything else is a vector. The number alpha, we're just going to pull it out front because numbers two times four is four times two. So we'll pull it out front. So alpha is going to be out front. And then for these vector things, we're gonna we're gonna bring this guy h the whole h. We're gonna bring the whole h in to project along the first vector, and the whole a and, and and we get this piece here. And we're gonna bring the whole h in to project along the second vector, and we get this piece here. So this plus this being projected by h gets this red piece from the first part of the of the the sum. In this green piece from the second part of the cell. Yeah. And then we look at the projections here, right? And again, we, um, we're projecting two perpendicular vectors. So this green projection should be zero. And we're projecting two vectors that are themselves. It's a vector onto itself. So this projection should be one, the number one. And so we're left with alpha times one along the horizontal direction plus a zero vector, which I've chosen to not write here at all. But you can imagine a plus a zero vector along the horizontal. But I'm just gonna write it as alpha along the horizontal. Okay. So <clears throat> that H, the action of the horizontal filter onto the diagonal vector leaves us with alpha along the horizontal. Okay, and again, the alpha is coming from that original arbitrary mix of alpha and betas all the way back here. What comes out, the beta part is gone, just the alpha part is left <clears throat> after going through both filters. And <clears throat> by um, looking at the horizontal filter, and, uh, and, the, and the diagonal filter here. And just kind of playing with the angles. I'll hold, one, I'll hold this one still. Just play, again, playing with the angles here. What you would find after carefully observing how, how bright the light is at different angles is when they're parallel, all the light, whatever got through the first filter N is getting through the second filter N. We've already looked at the uh, perpendicular case. It's basically zero. I'm going to call it zero. There's defects in the films. I'm not holding it parallel. So it's basically, it really should be zero by observation. And then if you change this angle around, you would find that at, at 45 degrees, you'd, your, your light would be half as bright um, as parallel orthogonal right in the middle. There's a special case right in the middle of those angles, 45 degrees. You'd get, you'd see once if you can quantify the light brightness carefully, half of what gets through the single filter. So the single filter is doing filtering by itself. I don't care how many photons are coming out of my light bulb on its own, but after it comes through, some n got through, and once it goes through the second filter, this is a half happens to be the case. Okay, now, <clears throat> so we've kind of advanced our diagram a little bit. The top part we've advanced to say that the, the polarization should be some alpha horizontal and the amount of photons should be half of what got through a single filter. On the top of the diagram, we have vectors. On the bottom of the diagram, we have numbers. These are very different mathematical things, right? The vectors have direction to them and the numbers don't, among other differences. Um, 
is there a way to think of to, to relate this number one half to this number like thing alpha? This is what a theorist would think about. <clears throat> That's a, a natural question that would come up. How do I bridge the vector side of the diagram to the number side? Well, <clears throat> as we saw earlier, the length of a vector is a number, that, that, that alpha. And alpha, those numbers, alpha and beta, um, they can be, it, it seems that they could be positive numbers or negative numbers, right? Uh, because if we were to talk about, uh, if we had uh, those two axes, and we're talking about locations, for example, take, take a metaphorical detour for a second. If we're talking about locations on a map, and I told you to go one mile north and three miles east, we talk about north, south, east, and west. But mathematically, I could have used negative numbers. And if I wanted you to go south, I could tell you to go negative two miles north. <laughs> we don't talk like that. But mathematically, it would be totally fine. And all this, all this vector math that we've been doing on pencil and paper would work out if we use negative numbers that way. <clears throat> so negative two miles north is the same thing as two miles south. So because we've written these things so far, not with four directions, north, east, south, and west, but only two, if we use negative numbers, we get those opposite directions for free. Well, at the cost of introducing negative numbers, right? So the alpha could be a negative number, right? But these number, the, the number little h here isn't gonna be negative. It makes no physical sense for some negative number of photons to get through your filter, right? What would that even mean? Sometimes asking that leads to interesting discoveries, but in this case, no, it doesn't make any sense. So we can't just say, we can't just pluck these numbers, alpha and beta, and say, oh, they are these numbers, in this case, a half. They're not, because sometimes they're negative. Um, but <clears throat> one way to make sure that, uh, one way to, to act on these vectors with other vectors to make sure you get a, a number that's always positive out of whatever is going on with these alphas and betas is to project the vector onto itself. What In this case, we're going to project this vector, the, out, the output vector, alpha horizontal. Alpha horizontal projected onto itself is alpha horizontal and we're, again, the symbols say, make them look like they're smashing into each other. So flip this one around so it looks like this. But this thing that you flipped around is, it, is related to the original one. It has to have a length as well, alpha. So it's the vector projected onto itself where we hold on to the length of the thing, alpha, and the directionality of the thing, horizontal. And these alphas are numbers, so I'm going to pull this alpha out. And so I'm going to have, in the end, alpha times alpha and the projection of the two horizontals. And these are parallel with each other with the length of one. So this becomes a number one when we get an alpha squared, which suppose alpha was negative two. <clears throat> In which case we would have we would have had a different first filter, right? Why would it? So why would it negative? What do you mean negative? So um, I said let's orient the filter diagonally this way, and we drew our axes in a certain way, right? Well, what if I have a filter that's orthogonal to uh, perpendicular to that, so that the the symbol isn't up and to the right, but down and to the left, right? So it's down and to the left. We'd have some negative we'd have some negative numbers because it's going down and to the left or up and to the right, in which case, and the only difference there is that in one case, if you think of it as down and to the right, <clears throat> that vertical component should be negative. If you think of it instead as up and to the left, then the horizontal component needs to be negative, one or the other. Um, curiously, there seems to be 
some freedom to think about things is this way or 90 degrees uh, or, or 90 degrees that the other way or 180 degrees rather this way or the other way around. Okay, so suppose alpha was a negative number like negative two. Negative two times negative two gives us a positive four. Right? So this thing alpha squared is going to be guaranteed to be a positive number. That's a good sign because this thing h little h should definitely only be positive should not be negative. So physicists would say this is okay this seems reasonable I, I have some vector i'm again i'm trying to bridge these two sides vectors to number sides. Um, to understand the theory more fully so whatever's happening on the vector side I can get maybe I can bridge by taking that vector and projecting it onto itself, which will give me a number, which is a definitely positive number. Could be zero. So it's zero or up. Right. Okay. Now, this, this sort of reasoning that I'm doing here with you is, is what physicists really think about when they're in uncharted territory. They're thinking about design. It's, it's a design problem. And the design problem has a couple of constraints. And I, I tried to make some of them explicit with you here, right? One is it needs to match up with uh, observation <laughs> experiments. The other is um, it needs to be consistent with the math rules you chose to play with. When we said maybe it's a vector, we, we chose a bunch of rules that we shouldn't be violating. Otherwise, we need to pick something, some other mathematical idea. And this sort of like this last thing I'm saying, like, how do you bridge this to this? Well, this is an, always a positive number and this can sometimes be a negative number. Well, one way to always get a positive number from this thing is to project it onto itself. Okay. So it's, it's like narrowing your design space as a physicist. Okay. Now, because I, I think, especially Herman, I think you're asking, but why? <laughs> Very good question, but so far in the in the talk, it's sort of like the our reasoning seems to be leading this leading us down this path of decisions. Of design. I have a suspicion. I have a suspicion from what you're doing. <laughs> of okay, what's involved. <laughs> you probably I are. have to do this imaginary numbers to probably possibly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, I won't get into that, but totally. Yeah. Hey, so Paul, no. Paul so, yeah. can I ask a quick question? Um, I, I am trying to understand, am I supposed to think about projecting a number onto itself as multiplication then, not a, not addition? Yes, more like multiplication. Okay, yes. gotcha. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're projecting a vector onto itself. And the vector has a directional piece and a, a lengthy piece. A number. This thing's a number, and this thing is not a number. It's got some direction to it. Yeah. Just like um, go two miles north, there's the two part, which is a number, and the north part, which is a direction. <clears throat> okay, so let's think about it, right? So may, if this is right, if this is the right bridge, to go from one side of the diagram to the other. Then this little h in this special case, again, this has to do with the filters we chose and the order of them, right? Through, through observation, you would find that in this case of the two filter orientations, little h is a half. And then whatever alpha was, alpha squared must be a half. If this is the bridge, if this is the right bridge, what we're saying is alpha squared is little h. And in this case, little h is a half. So we're going to make the, the leap and say, suppose this is right. In that case, alpha is this, if, we, if we're, we're interested in what alpha is, because that was in the original description of the polarization vector. If alpha squared is a half, then just from regular math, alpha is one over the square root of two. Or in other words, one over the square root of two squared is one half. 
So let's go. So if we go back to the way we wrote the diagonal 45 degree diagonal polarization vector, we're going to rewrite alpha as one over square root of two. Okay, so again, Herman's great question at, towards the top was what the hell are these coefficients alpha and beta, these numbers alpha and beta. In this special case, we have a number, a particular number, one over root two. Okay, it seems to let us bridge from this side of the diagram to the other side to say, if we have some idea of what's happening to the polarization vector, we can say something about how much light is shining through. Um, let me see what my next, yeah, good, okay. So, hmm, what does this tell us? What is this, where is this leading us logically? So, <clears throat> so I've rewritten the diagram and I've rewritten our 45 degree polarization vector with the one over root two part instead of alpha. What's going on here? Okay, so suppose, suppose this polarization vector is about a single photon, okay? The brightness thing we were talking about is a stream of lots of photons coming at us, right? So suppose, or another way to think about order of thinking, suppose all that light coming at us is made up of little indivisible parts called photons. And suppose this is a description of each individual photon after it gets through that first diagonal filter. This is, again, this is F for not, it's from the light bulb through the diagonal filter is what this is, okay. If, <clears throat> if all the photons behave exactly the same way, then we should be able to deduce the behavior of the whole entire stream of them from what's happening to each individual one of them, okay? But if a photon is indivisible, then when it hits that first filter, the, the, the diagonal one, if it's indivisible, the whole photon either got through the filter or the whole photon did not get through the filter, got absorbed by the filter, and turned into heat. If it's indivisible, if we're saying, no, photons, light is this stream of stuff and the little parts of it, each little part is indivisible. That indivisible part made it or didn't make it, right? So <clears throat> when it gets filtered by the second piece here, the next piece, and we see the, the, the vector turned from this to just this, one over root two horizontal, just the horizontal part. That one over root two is not, it can't be the case logically that a piece of the photon got through. This piece got through is inconsistent with the idea. So sorry, this piece got through, whereas this piece didn't get through the second filter is not consistent with the idea that photons indivisible, right? It's not consistent. Um, what's, what else could this one over root two be telling us? If all the photons behave the same way, statistically, we should be able, using statistics, if they all behave the same way, then using statistics of lots and lots of them, we should, we should be able to say what's happening to all of them. If we understood, if we could, if we had information about the statistics of a single photon, and if they all act the same way as each other, we should be able to deduce something about how they all behave together. This is similar to saying, if I have a single penny, and I know the statistics of how this single penny behaves when I flip it, then I should be able to deduce the statistics of a thousand pennies being flipped at once, or flipping that one penny a thousand times and recording the results. Because every time I flip it, it's the same penny. So whatever I'm saying statistically about the, the penny should work all 1,000 times I flip it and say something about a collection of 1,000 flips. 
if I'm talking about a thousand individual pennies, if I trust that they're all manufactured the same way, then the statistics of one ideal penny should tell me something about flipping a thousand pennies all at once. And in this case, if every photon is the same, behaves exactly the same way, then if I know the statistics about one of the photons, I should be able to deduce something that's happening to billions of them or whatever the number happens to be, lots of them, lots in this case with the light bulb, lots per second. So, um, okay. So perhaps what this vector is telling us is that for each photon that goes through the diagonal filter, each one either goes through the next horizontal filter or it gets absorbed by it with equal probability in this case of a half or 50% chance. So, and if that was, if that's what's happening, if this number here squared is not telling us that a piece of the photon went through or didn't, but that there's a 50% chance that this piece gets through and a 50% chance that this piece gets blocked, for each photon, then and I throw n photons at this filter, big a big number n. Then half of those n should get through. So those alphas and betas squared seem to be statements of probability. It's again. It's there are a couple of there are a couple of things hanging together here. One, photons are not in, are, are not divisible, so it can't be that we can't interpret this vector as saying when when we hit it with the horizontal vector, we're not saying this piece of the photon got through. Like it's not consistent with them being indivisible. If all the photons behave the same way then the statistics of one tell us something about the statistics of all of them. So are we saying that because we know photons are indivisible, therefore, like this, this form of mathematics has to be probabilistic? <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. That's a great question. <laughs> oh, man, such a good question. See, the thing about science is like, your theories need to hang together with each other consistently, right? And that's why the whole gravity and quantum mechanics not having a clear bridge upsets people. They're not, they're, there's no clear way to hang them together with each other. And, and so what you asked is a great question. And it would say, I would say, so far our theoretical interpretation and development of things gives us a hypothesis that we would say, looks like photons aren't, aren't divisible. Then we can go devise an experiment, a different experiment, not involving these filters and stuff, and go test it out, right? And there are other reasons with other experiments that, are, that the math, here we've developed this math to make sense of this very weird stuff. Ooh, super strange, They're, what the hell? But it's all consistent with this math. Um, so go try to go experiment and try to make sense of another bizarre behavior of photons and see if the indivisibility of them points you in a certain direction in the development of the theory or a different direction. They are divisible. But we so it, turns out that, it turns out that a bunch of other weird aspects of photons um, have math that works if and only if you think of them as indivisible. There are different parts in these other phenomena and the thinking of the theory of explaining these other phenomena about photons where the, where that little, well, if it was indivisible, then the math works like this. They all have that sort of branch point of if it's indivisible, the math means this. When you they think of visible, to say, they all hang together to say that they're indivisible. 
Paul, Paul, when you say divisible, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. When you say divisible, are you saying it can't be broken into components? Is that what you mean by divisible? Yeah, because it's one way you might think, one way you might try to make sense of this vector stuff, right? Because you might say, if I have the diagonal polarization vector of a single photon, single photon here, then I'm going to send it through this horizontal part, and my math tells me that this should come out the other side, which is just this part of it, but this plus that, just this part, right? Right. So when you're trying to make sense of this thing, the math, and say, what does the math mean physically? You might, a reasonable person might say, maybe it means this piece of the photon got through and this other part's in. Oh, okay, because, okay, yeah, because based on the presumption that that uh, we're talking about if the, this math should work with a single photon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, I missed that part. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to pretend that we can tie this all into a nice bow by saying that the concept of quantum, you know, where each, you know, each quantum thing is, you know, quanta is supposed to be something that's like uh, um, discrete, right? And so I'm going to just pretend that that explains everything. That you know, if the photon is indivisible, then bam, quantum. I don't right, think Paul, I can that, do that. Though. <laughs> it's one of the things. It's, it's actually one of the things, so yeah, not well, by itself. Are, are, are we through the math? Because did we do the scenario? Did we do the scenario where we put the filter in between the two? Good question. We didn't do that scenario. Here we did are. We? This is no, we haven't done it yet, but here it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to brush through this real quick because Herman, I think you're the only one who cares. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, besides me. True. Oh, not true. Good. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get through this relatively quickly. Good. I'm glad you all care. I care. <laughs> so here's that weird scenario. Thanks, Herman. So we now I'm the diagram. I'm going to say what the polarization vector is in state one, state two, state three, state four. Right. Going through these filters. State one. I don't know what's coming out of my light bulb. I'm going to write it in the most general way. Alpha could be a negative number, or, or what, what, I don't know. I'm just going to call it alpha and beta. Yeah. Hits the horizontal filter to go to state two. H was that weird, we, we, we talked about the, the weird thing. H is a certain, like a projection. And so just this piece comes out of the projection of the original state vector. So far, so good. Next, we are going to send it through the diagonal filter. I'm going to write that as a D, capital D. So as the original vector hits the horizontal, hits D. In the first lecture, I explained this weird order of symbols from right to left. So first, we'll just care where we're going to rewrite from step two. What is H time, H acting on psi? It's alpha horizontal. So that red. Part. Wait, Paul, Paul, yeah. Paul, you locked me here. Because if you just said we were assuming that photons are indivisible, so that doesn't that break your one and two, your one to two, your no, step one to step no, two? No. So, so one to two, what is, it's a matter of how do we interpret this thing? Is this a chunk of the original? No. What I was saying in the last slide is that this alpha is saying that there's some probability that this psi got through the horizontal vector. What's the probability that that, that photon got through this first filter? The probability it got through is alpha squared. Oh, okay. So we're moving forward based on the theory mm -hmm. of probability. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Got it. So each acting on psi is alpha horizontal. I wrote, rewrote that here and there. What the hell is going to be capital D? Well, it, it's no different than the horizontal and the vertical. You take whatever the the vector that would get through is, which we derived just in the last step. When we send a photon through the diagonal vector, this is what comes out, right? So we take the thing that comes out of the filter and we do the mirror of it and the two come together, represent the cap represent the filter. We're, hopefully that makes sense. Right? It's no different than what we did with the horizontal and the vertical ones where we took the piece that gets through horizontal 
and we mirrored, we flipped the symbol around. That's what we're doing with D here. And then uh, what we'll do here is we'll do some of the, we'll do the simple mo moving of the numbers, the one over root two, one over root two, and the alpha. We'll move all of those and combine and multiply them together, and move them all the way to the left. So one over root two squared is a half, and the alpha also comes along. This blue part, I'm just going to keep the same, but I'm going to cross multiply the green and the red parts. So this part came from the green expression, this part came from the red, this part plus a part from the green expression, a part from the red expression. These guys are perpendicular, so the, the projection is zero, and the projection here is the number one. And so we're left with the blue part. And the, and the numbers out front. Okay, so far so good. We're in, we've figured out with the math, we followed the math to step three. Let's now move on to step four. It was some polarization, went through H, went through D, now it's gonna go through V. D, H, Psi, we just calculated it. So I'm gonna bring it down here. And then this, these two symbols together represent the vertical filter. I'm going to move the numbers out front. I'm going to bring this vector down and I'm going to cross multiply this with these two. The cross multiplication is this projected onto this plus this projected onto that, which is this plus this. These are perpendicular, so they're zero plus these are themselves, so and they're of length one each, so this is one. And so it's one times what was out front. So we bring down what was out front. And then our interpretation of what is this number out front mean? It means that the probability of a photon from my light bulb getting through all of the filters is that number out front squared, one half alpha squared, or one quarter alpha squared, which is not zero. Right. In other words, in fact, so whatever this is, assuming alpha is not zero, <laughs> this thing ain't zero, which is great news for our theory. Because <laughs> right? again, this is scenario ain't zero. <laughs> Although your intu intuition might have been that it should be zero. So the math here, oh, and, and, and interpreting it as a probability. This goes back to one of Abby's earlier questions is how bright is that relative to a single filter? How bright is that? It should be, you, you can get that, how bright is that by, by, from this number? So suppose my light bulb was shining out, um, a, uh, was shining out a, 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 a light with a polarization that was, ex it was just 50-50% chance horizontal or vertical. Then alpha, then alpha from my light bulb, if it was treating, if it didn't select a particular polarization, it was just a coin flip about which direction it was polarized in from my light bulb, then alpha would be one over square root of two, right? 50-50 chance, one half, one half, square root of those. 1 over root 2, that's what alpha would be. Then getting through all of these filters, alpha squared would be a half, and overall this would be a factor of 1 eighth. And so then the math is, would answer Abby's question that the light should be 1 eighth as bright as without any of the filters. So, Paul, a uh, basic question. Why does Squaring the number make it a probability that I missed something early. Yeah, um, yeah. From this piece, I was saying we were trying to see if we could connect these two parts of our theory. Well, this yeah, I got this part where you're pro you're projecting alpha the alpha vector onto itself, so you ended up squaring as part of that math. I got that, but why does this? Why does that make it a probability? Right, but why is it a probability? That came from this part where we started to 
ask, what does this mean physically? Does it mean we are splitting the photon and if some chunk of it is getting through? No. Well, what would be consistent? What would be a consistent way to bridge these two number like things? Is if these things are talking about probabilities. And if the if the probability of a single photon is is understood to be the square of this thing, then when you throw n photons, each with a half probability of getting through, then half of the original n should get through. Can I interject because this is connecting um, to the the Kiskit lecture that I listened to on Friday by mm -hmm. Philip Ball, and um, I still don't understand anything. But some but he explained something really nicely about how it's not about isness; it's about ifness. And so now we're talking about, and, and he was trying to relate it to probabilities, and that happened to stick with me. So totally, yeah. yes, yeah, I saw that lecture; it was great, but. I was like, yeah, if you're not a physicist, I don't know if it would make sense, but that part stuck out for me too. And that's right. And so the question of what this number means is, uh, isness would say this is some chunk of a photon and I split it in half. Ifness would say this has something to tell us about probabilities. And um, it's the squaring that allows us to make sure that even in the case that this number is a negative number, we're able to get positive numbers every time. And we, we definitely want positive numbers that are always only positive here, right? And so it's the squaring. Like the squaring, squaring is, I don't know where the squaring comes. I, I know why we have to square to get the positive number. I just don't know, like, <laughs> where, it comes from. This is what I, I said earlier. Really I said, Herman, you're going to say, but why? And the answer <laughs> is a design choice. The answer is we're designing the math, we're designing the physical interpretation of the math. And then we do experiments to see what's what, and to see if our interpretation makes sense in different scenarios. And so, so thank yeah, so this at the squaring is was sort of like when I originally introduced it, I was saying, well, we need positive numbers. This is one way to do it. Um, is it the right way to get positive numbers? Experiment, the experiments we just did seem to say yes, that the squaring is the right thing to do to get the positive but, number. Yeah, the reason as opposed is, to yeah. let's say, as opposed to say taking the fourth power. You could get a, always get right. A no, no. I, I, I get that. I get that. Um, uh, the reason I said that the squaring seems somewhat arbitrary. It seems like we're not trying to deal with the imaginary component, right? So oh, we won't get into that. I don't want to get into that. But, oh, okay. So you, we're just kind of skipping because I, I think that's the missing piece for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm skipping that because most people don't learn about complex numbers. I'm not getting into it. But if you were worried for you, Herman, if you were worried about, and you should be. It's right to. If you're worried about what if alpha and beta were complex numbers, how do I always get not just a positive number, but a real number? You, you would change this a little bit and you'd say it's not alpha squared, it's the modulus of alpha squared. And I won't get into it. Uh, beyond oh, okay. Got but you're right. I you're right to worry about that and there's a way to fix it. You just need to fix it a little bit. So um, okay, let's 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 go back here. All right, so we got something that's not zero. That's really good. And if we interpret this thing as squaring these numbers gives us a probability, we get the right sort of brightness numbers that we're, we're observing. Now, um, lots of different things in the quantum realm behave this way, um, including various types of quantum bits or qubits that we make today, we being the, the Earth. <laughs> All of humanity. IBM makes one thing, right? But there, you know, you may know working at IBM Quantum that there are other uh, other ways to build quantum bits than the ones we do. Well, uh, so if you looked at the physical real qubits, they'd look pretty totally different from each other, and be like, "How is this and this both qubits? What? They're so different." But the thing they have in common is they all act like polar, like the polarization of photons in this case. 
they all act, they all act like that in some way so that you can have a quantum bits state be represented in, in terms of a, of a vector with two parts that are perpendicular to each other and have coefficient have these numbers out front that when you square them are actually saying something about the probability of what's happening to the, the to the quantum bit and um you know this is really the, this whole thing like these this whole lecture is really the heart of quantum mechanics and quantum computing once you use them for processing info and um it opens up every can of worms we're right at the press we're right at the point where you've got the can opener to every can of worms for quantum computing uh, for quantum mechanics in general what you know wait when we're talking about the, the probabilistic interpretation of this number out here and the vector in general, you know, what does it mean to have a theory that tells you that the photon had a 50 50 <laughs> shot of getting through a filter? Um, why, if it's 50 50, why the why why that outcome and not the other? Why is it just probably why is just why is it just statistics? For each photon, each every every individual photon, statistics. Why is that? You know, so you can take that can of worms and open up, and then multiple interpretations. One of those interpretations is many worlds theory. In our world, that photon got through. In another world, it did. It didn't get through. Uh, and there are lots of other like so like. Herman, you were asking kind of mathematical and physical questions about this stuff. And once you once you uh, kind of settle on results for those types of questions, you've got scarier questions. <laughs> like, what does it mean? And that's what Philip Ball, I thought, did a, did a nice job getting into. Um, but what I hope you guys got out of this lecture is there are things that you can touch <laughs> without a super fancy lab by the way you can order this again it's called a linear polarizer i bought it off amazon for like 10 bucks um and a light bulb <laughs> and you're good to go and you're doing and you're doing and you're seeing real behavior that is um really only understandable with quantum mechanics and these weird interpretations of um probabilistic descriptions of photons um yeah, in a sense, that's the end of my lecture. Um, any questions? I could go on. I'm going to stop it. That, that, that was great. <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> I, you know, I showed my son that that very thing because we have a th we have one of those older 3D TVs. I don't know. If, they didn't really take take. So I don't think a lot of people have them, but they come with those glasses. They use polarized light, and so I showed him that. But I did. I had never. So I was always in this real world kind of okay breaks its components you got the vertical component or whatever vector in the horizontal component and i did not know that there was a third piece where if i took another one and put it in between that would have been completely unexplainable and would have just <laughs> the, the demolished everything i just explained to him but yeah. um so is this in a way so are, are people accepting the fact that while something physical may seem to disappear probability still kind of travel through space? Oh, hey, good question. <laughs> all of your questions, you should come to all my talks. So I wanted to, I, I don't know how well this is gonna come through on the camera, but I've got a, I got a demo that experiments that exact question. <laughs> okay. Here's the next piece of lab equipment you will need to acquire, procure. Um, Plastic bottle. So let's take the two filters. I'm going to orient them in the way that no light gets through a pair of them. Two, just two, not three. And then I'm going to, instead of slipping a third one of those films in the middle, I'm going to slip the bottle, the plastic bottle in the middle. I'm not sure how well this is going to come through, but you should be looking for. Hey, Paul, that... uh, can you stop sharing your screen so we can see that bigger? Oops, yeah. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, put me in uh, whatever they call it, uh, stage mode. <clears throat> there. Um, 
you should be seeing colors that kind of reminisce, reminiscent of um, oil slicks, you might see. Prisms. Or prisms, yeah. Do you, does, does everyone see a little bit of like rainbow colors anywhere? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's really, really much more clear in person when you hold it up to the, towards the sun or the sky. Not exactly this. Don't look at the sun. <laughs> <laughs> but if you hold it up, it's really something else. It, it's like very, very visible. I think the materials that cover this web camera are partially polarized. And so it's screwing up the effect. But <clears throat> the, um, what you're seeing there is that the, this material also has chains of molecules and it's another plastic, just like the polarizer films. So it's made of chains of molecules with a certain directionality to them. And, you, and this bottle, like a, maybe a Coke bottle or something has been squished in a certain, in a certain shape. Um, so the polymers are changing their direction where the, the shape has been distorted. So to, to create this shape and the plastic in this bottle is sending light each photon in a direction that depends on its polarization. So this bottle and the light going through it, the is changing the direction of the photons and the direction that the, a, an individual individual photon goes in is completely determined by its polarization. Maybe it's color too, but the, the yeah, color frequency, using these things, because we're using these things to see that rainbow, it's definitely polarization affected. And so um, so uh, instead of asking with those vectors and those probability things when you square them, vectors about going along a straight line, whether it gets through a filter or not, when you look at this phenomenon with this thing, you can ask, did it go this way or did it go that way to each photon? And again, uh, it's not, here's a photon, I broke it in half, and this half went there and that half went there. No, that's not how we interpret quantum mechanics. It's so, weirder. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a probability it went this way and a probability it went that way. It, it's, are you explaining refraction? Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is refraction that, that you know, for everyone else, refraction just means light hits something, um, and as it goes through that thing, it changes direction. And you may have seen, uh, what's that band, Russell, with the prism? Pink Floyd? Pink Floyd. <laughs> oh, I should know that. I'm thrilled you went to Floyd me. has a prism, yeah. <laughs> so that prism is showing refraction. It's the light's going through the crystal, and it's and the crystal, as it's going through the crystal, changed directions. It also changes directions when it goes from being in the crystal to being in the air. Um, and so the, the, the direction changes are happening at the boundary of two things. So this thing is doing that, but it's how bent, where the direction the, the, the light's being bent depends on the polarization. Now that's weird. And so um, that, so, so, uh, in fact, uh, earlier, some, I think it was Herman again, you, you were mentioning the 3D glasses, right? And the sunglasses, I said, don't do that. The two lenses are the same orientation. But I said, but which orientation? And I showed you with the light bulb, it didn't seem to matter. It does matter because <clears throat> when light bounces off of water, just like this thing, instead of going, in, in this case, it was light going through and the direction it went through depended on the polarization. But sometimes reflection has a similar aspect to it. So that the, the bouncing off of something like sunlight off of the surface of water um, will, will depend on polarization as well. And it turns out that um, your sunglasses, your polarized sunglasses have the polymers oriented horizontally, left and right, and not vertically, because when 
when light from the sun bounces off of water, it preferentially reflects light that's polarized horizontally, not vertically. And so Which is why you, you use polarized sunglasses when you're fishing. Yes, and it's also why you don't want to tilt your head like this. And actually, you should now, because or or look through the glasses, obviously, right? To, take the glasses off, rotate it this way, and and rotate your glasses while you're looking off, looking at the surface of the water. And you'll see that when it's horizontal, when it's oriented the normal way you wear them, all those reflections seem to go away. And if you hold it ninety degrees, it's, it's you don't want to look at it; it's too bright. Uh, yeah, so so you, these ideas of uh, getting through the filter or not, and this weird probabilistic interpretation, extends to lot all all quantum phenomena, including the ones that have to do with where things are, where are they going, what color is it, right? Like even the color of a particular photon will have a probability of being this color versus that, and um, really, uh, quantum mechanics, the math of it doesn't get much more complicated than what I showed you in this lecture. <laughs> it's really this. <laughs> so, uh, don't get so, don't, you know, don't kowtow to a physicist anymore. <laughs> Just be like, it, yeah, does, it does not get hard. more complicated than this. <laughs> Sorry? It does not get more complicated than this. Not really. <laughs> Here's how it gets more complicated. <laughs> In this case, we were looking at uh, a property that has two, you break it up into a vector in terms of two parts, the horizontal and vertical parts, right? One way things get more complicated for other quantum phenomena is that you need to break it up into more than two parts, statistically, in this, this vector-like thing, yeah? Here's an example, the extreme example. Instead of two, um, horizontal or vertical polarization. What about um, if you were tracking the position of a photon just going through space in one direction? So <clears throat> you, let's say I know it lies along a line, a particular line. Is it here or here or here or here at different times? Well, it turns out you can only talk about it before you observe it. You can only talk about it probabilistically and say there's a chance that it's there and there's another chance that it's there. And so what does this have to do with the vectors? Well, if it's there, it's not there when I observe it, when I really do look at it. It's either just like the photons. We talk about it probabilistically until we look at it, which we were doing with the camera, looking at a lot of them, right? It did or it didn't when we're looking through. Each of those many, many photons did or did not because we're looking at it. Um, with the position, when we look at it, it is, it is there or it isn't. It is there or it isn't. It is there or it isn't. And if it's there, it's not anywhere else. <clears throat> if it's there, if it's not, if it's there, it's not anywhere else. It is just like the perpendicularness of vectors, where the vector, in this case for position, has as many parts of the vector that are perpendicular to each other as there are points in the space. So if, as relativity tells us, if space uh, is continuous, as I zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, it still looks like space. Then for the problem of when thinking about where is a photon along this line in terms of vectors, there are infinitely many vectors that are each perpendicular to each other in that projection sense. You project one onto the other, you get zero. You project one onto itself, you get one. And you say there's some probability that it's here and some probability that it's there. Maybe the probability is nice and smooth over space, but you're talking about an, infinitely dim an infinite dimensional vector in that case. That's the hardest example. So that's one way quantum mechanics gets harder in different scenarios. But actually, at that, there's, there's, there's shortcuts that make that actually easy. They seem like, whoa, you know, it's hard enough with two. You tell me I have to deal with an infinite number. 
sounds impossible. That's just not, there's a, there are tricks. <laughs> so that's one way it gets harder. And I'll stop at that. Any other questions? <laughs> I'll actually, unfortunately, have to stop it too. We're at the top of the hour. Um, but I would say let's keep it going on Slack if there are more questions. But otherwise, Paul, this was super great. Thank, and also, thanks this for giving us some more. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, Paul thank thank you. you. Maybe Simple. you could do one walking through like one of these actual algorithms for us sometime. Like I was just trying to read through the Grover's algorithm one, and they do some funky thing with notations that confuses me. So. Yeah, when you think, no, just one last thing, guys. When you see zero and one vectors, just think of horizontal vertical polarization vectors. Because that's what quantum computing is. You take sure. something that acts like this and you label one of those two, you label one zero, you label the other one one, and you go ahead with that and you keep it zero one. Ah, uh, that makes sense. It's going to help. Okay. It's going to help. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye.